haven't had a chance to do so, uh, we would like for you to fill out one of the digital connection cards. If you're in the house, you can reach that by scanning the QR code on the seat in front of you. If you're in your house, you can go to Northfield Church app or website under that digital connection card and fill that out. You can let us know any prayer requests you have, things going on with your family. You can sign up to learn about a ministry or to jump into a ministry. You can sign up for life groups, support groups, care groups, all of those different things, summer camp for students. You can sign up this coming week, the father's daughter sock hop, the mother's son sock hop. You can sign up for baptism at one of our three Easter services. I know we've not said a lot about those yet, but we're going to have our Friday night, night of worship. I hope you are preparing for that. And then Saturday night will be our first Easter service. Uh, that will be the identical service to uh, 8 o'clock 9.30 and 11 on Sunday morning. So four times there, we're going to be baptizing people at all services. If baptism is something that you've thought about but have just been putting off, what, a, what an incredible weekend to participate uh, in, that, uh, uh, in that act of following Jesus. So thank you very much for that. Thank you uh, for your patience as we figure out parking, especially for this service. Uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are trying something even different today. So, uh, hey, tell us in a nice way whether it works or not, and uh, remember where you are. You're at church, not. <laughs> and last, I'd love for you to check in on Facebook or Instagram. We partner with an organization called Causally, and you can do a little bit of good in the world just by checking in online. I think this uh, quarter we are providing shoes uh, for people who don't have some. So, Hey, we're changing things up just a little bit. Uh, we've got people at the doors uh, with communion cups. If you did not get a communion cup, we're going to go straight into the message today. If you did not get a communion cup, go ahead and raise your hand. They'll give you one of those. We're going to participate in communion together towards the end of our message time this morning. We're reversing our order primarily because of an announcement, an announcement that uh, we are both excited about, but we are also a little bit sad about at the same time. It was just over four and a half years ago that I met a couple named Josh and Lena Wooten, and once you met them, you cannot forget them. They had been visiting our church family, and when I met them, they were not dressed as Josh and Lena. They were dressed as Woody and uh, Jesse, I think it is. I think we have a picture of them over there. They were greeting long before they were members here at the uh, Student Center on one of our trunk or treat nights. And little did I know that in just a few short months from that picture being taken that Josh and Lena would become part of our church family and Josh would come on board working with our next gen team. They quickly formed a life group and then they began to do what Josh and Lena do best, to make a difference in the lives of both students and adults. And it is with a bit of excitement for them, but also a bit of excitement on our part uh, that I announced that Josh and Lena have taken on a role at a church in Franklin, Tennessee, where they're going to be moving. Um, Josh and Lena, I would like you to come up here beside me, if you will. Uh, Josh is going to be working alongside Jim Weidman, his mentor, for over 20 years. And they're going to be able to do ministry uh, uh, in, in a different way and, and uh, just uh, a way of doing that together. Josh wrote these words from the very first moment that Lena and I began to serve the Lord over 23 years ago. We always felt a profound calling to serve together in ministry, firmly believing that our paths were intertwined for God's divine purpose. It is with the blend of excitement and bittersweet emotion that we share the next news of our faith journey and our step. This decision did not come lightly as it means stepping away from a community that has become our family. From the moment we stepped into this Northville community, you have made us feel like family. You not only accepted the fact that I was a little bit off the beaten path of most pastors, whether it was in my unique sense of fashion, you notice today his life alert is missing, uh, his, uh, his peace pen or whatever that is, as uh, Amy called that. <laughs> he said, my warped sense of humor or my ability to sing a song in times where May didn't even call for a song. In talking with Lena uh, over the past week, Lena said these words, This has been the hardest decision Josh and I have ever made. We're leaving a place where we know so many, where our support system is, and where we have ministered for many years, and headed to a place where we know no one. It would have been easy to say no, and at first we did, but God didn't call us to easy. He called us to obedience. And as Josh and I began to pray, we began to realize that this opportunity was from him. 
We are both a bit scared, but we are confident that this is what God wants us to do in the next chapter of our lives. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I thought for the last week and a half, how do you say goodbye to a, a pastor who is so well-loved, not only by staff, but by so many uh, people, not only in our church family, but this community. I mean, this is not just here. This, you guys have ministered in this area for a long time. Uh, the first thing I would say this is you realize that this that goodbye isn't forever. Goodbye is just goodbye for now. Uh, one of the things I loved about Lena, she said, you're not going to keep me off the red carpet next year. So uh, I'm, we're, I am counting on that, sister. Uh, <laughs> uh, then you communicate that decision with the church family that loves you. And then we pray and we take a moment to celebrate you. So number one, I know this isn't goodbye. They have, they have family right here in our community. So we're going to see them at Kroger, and then we're gonna, uh, we may steal them a time or two. And uh, we communicate this decision, and then we pray over both of you. And, and I would love if, if you could maybe to extend your arms toward Josh and Lena, and we want to pray for them in this uh, new step in their lives. Heavenly Father, uh, I just want to thank you for the gift that is Josh and Lena. And Father, uh, while our hearts are a bit sad this morning for them, our hearts are overflowing with gratitude that you gave them to us. They were never ours. They were yours. And they have been obedient to your calling. So Father, for the way they have made your word exciting to so many students, for the way they have made us smile, for Josh's unique sense of humor and his sense of style, for Lena's love of working alongside Josh, Father, for their teaching, their influence, and their gift of encouragement for the way they have lifted you up in their lives and in their marriage, and for the example they have left on our students. All of us, Father, take a moment, and we just say thank you for the gift that is Josh and for the gift that is Lena. And, Fathers, they follow you in obedience. Our prayers that you lead them in the paths of righteousness. And I pray that they feel your presence as they make new friends, as they discover new ways to impact the kingdom of God in Franklin, just as they have done here. So, Father... May you bless them and keep them. May you make your face to shine upon them. May you be gracious to them and give them peace. And all of us at Northfield, in the name of Jesus, said, Amen. 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 You know, Josh, uh, uh, I told you at first service, uh, uh, I think back to, to all the decisions and all the messages that, that I've been able to, to, to witness, whether it was at beach camp or wherever, and all the things that you've taught me in the time here. Uh, and uh, after talking with them this week, I know it wasn't an easy decision for them to make, but I would like to thank them for the one final message they are leaving with us at this point in their lives, and that is to trust God with their calling, to trust God in obedience. As Lena and Josh both said, it would have been easy to just say no and to stay where it was comfortable, but God didn't always call us to comfortable. And I thank you that even as you take on this new role in your life, you leave us with a message of following God no matter what the cost. We love you both. <laughs> you. Church family, would you help me celebrate Josh and Lena? <laughs> Oh, my, Franklin doesn't know what's about to happen to them. <laughs> and I love it on there. Uh, uh, Josh and Lena are leaving here this service and going down to be with the, uh, our students where they're going to announce to them. So they will not be around right after the service, but they will be around next week and then the 17th in the green room. And then you can catch them at the 11 o'clock service as well, but we did not want to rush their time uh, in talking with the middle school students, especially that Josh has worked with uh, over the past few years. So uh, for those of you in our young adult ministry, Mike Parker and Julie Parker are going to kind of take the lead of that with some of the young adults. And uh, it's, uh, we're going we're gonna to rock on and we're going to uh, celebrate what God is doing in their lives. Hey, last week we began our study in the book of Acts. For those of you who are here, you may know that Acts is the second book that uh, a guy named Luke wrote. His first book was named after him, Luke, but it's actually the story of Jesus. And it begins with the birth of Jesus and it ends with the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus back into heaven. And as the book 
of Acts opens up, Luke begins by giving us a summary of how he actually ended the book of Luke. What I would like us to do out of reverence for the Word, you know, a lot of times in the Old Testament when the Word of God was read, they would stand in reverence uh, for that. So, hey, I'm going to ask you to stand and realize the words that we are uh, reading this morning come straight from inspired Scripture. Beginning in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In my former book, now the former book is the book of Luke. In my former book, Theophilus, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. And that's in Luke 24, 49. So you see playing out in Acts what happened in Luke, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, well, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Father, I thank you for the reading of the word. I pray that, uh, that you bless your word, that you uh, forgive the, the many faults of the one who presents it, and that, Father, that people will hear what they need to hear, that it will be from you today. And all of us at Northville said, amen. Thank you for standing with me. In the time that we have remaining, I want to talk to you a minute about the phrase we find in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It goes like this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in all of Judea, Jerusalem, and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Particularly focusing on this very first line, but you will receive power. Power when the Holy Spirit comes. Now that doesn't happen, that power, you don't see it coming until Acts chapter 2. And as you begin to read Acts chapter 2, what you find is this promise of a coming Holy Spirit. A, a promise that was made in the book of Luke as we looked at. And then as you open up the book of Acts, what Luke is going to do is remind us of that promise. He's even going to quote the words of Jesus looking at his disciples and said, hey, there is coming a day in the not too distant future when you're going to receive a power power to do something. Well, Acts chapter 2 is where you see that power being played out. Peter, the Holy Spirit comes. Peter starts preaching on the Jewish celebration of what we call Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. It was the celebration where all the Jewish people came back to Jerusalem 50 days after the Passover and would celebrate the harvest. They would celebrate what God had done among them and his provision for them. And as we saw in our series, we are the church. And Peter Peter starts preaching on this day of Pentecost, and the church is born. And again, as we saw, we saw that the church is not a time. It's not a place. It's not a building, but the church is a people. In fact, as a reminder, we define the church like this. We are the called out group of people. Here's our word, empowered by the, say it with me, Holy Spirit to continue the work of Jesus on this earth. And we're going to be talking about the Spirit all through these messages in the book of Acts here. And there, there is that phrase that I want us to think about again, empowered by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Because the promise of the Holy Spirit given in Acts chapter 1, and then the Holy Spirit comes in power in Acts chapter 2, and what you begin to see in Acts chapter 2 is the result 
of the Holy Spirit coming. What does it mean when the Holy Spirit comes on this group of people, these followers of Jesus? Well, for Peter, he gets up and he preaches the very first sermon of the church. He talks about the resurrection of Jesus. He talks about how David believed in the coming of Jesus and how Joel believed in the coming of Jesus and how Jesus appeared to many of them. And then he tells the people, including the religious leaders who had taken charge and putting Jesus to death. He says, you killed Jesus, but God raised him up. And they were so convicted by Peter's message that the people looked and they said, well, what do we do? Can we fix that? Is there any way that we can make amends for this wrong that we have done? And one of the ways I know that we were looking at the power of the Holy Spirit when you get to the sermon that Peter preaches is because it was just 53 days before this that Peter ran when a servant girl. Peter cursed when a servant girl just looked at him and said, well, aren't you one of his? I mean, you're a Galilean. Your speech betrays you. And Scripture says that Peter was like cursing and swearing. I do not know the man. And now Peter stands up in front of the very people who had taken the charge of putting Jesus to death and says, guess what? You killed the Messiah. You killed him. And then he has a boldness that cannot be explained. And then instead of running from the leaders, he looks at the religious leaders and all the people who had gathered on this feast of Pentecost and he begins to tell them what to do. The same Peter who had ran when a servant girl said, I think you're one of them, is now standing up in front of the people who crucified Jesus and said, guess what? You need to repent. You need to turn around. You need to change directions. And you need to be baptized in the name of the man that you put to death. Well, how did they respond? 3,000 of them on day one, ground zero of the church, said yes. And on that day, the church wasn't about a building. You know why the church wasn't about a building? They did have a building. And the church wasn't about the book of Acts. You know why the church wasn't about the book of Acts on day one? They didn't have the book of Acts to go by. Little did they know, they were the players who would be who would become the book of Acts as it plays out. And this group of Jesus followers, well, they start telling the story of Jesus to anyone who would listen. The same group that had run. The same group that had denied. The same group that we're told just a few days before were hiding in Jerusalem behind locked doors. The same group of people who had decided, you know, this Jesus movement is dead. We're going to go back to what we used to know, which was fishing or whatever it might be. And now they are standing up and preaching the story of Jesus with a power and a boldness that no one had seen before. And if you're wondering what in the world did that, two things. Resurrection. It's hard to be quiet when you've seen a dead man come to life. In fact, I doubt none of y'all have seen that because I think I would have heard about it. That would have been something you would have told me. (laughs) Second thing, the the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapters 1 and 2, I think, help explain that. And it all centers around Acts chapter 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And the result of this power that they were given was that the church, the church that you, the church that that all of us are part of today was born. And on opening day, 3,000 people said, yes, we had a part. We had something to play in the death of Jesus. And they said, yes, and they submitted to being baptized in the name of the one they had killed. But look at the rest of Acts chapter 1-8. It doesn't end there. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So what I want you to do is imagine the scene for a moment. Jesus is gathered with his disciples on the outskirts of Jerusalem on a mountainside. One of the versions says near Bethany. They are still overwhelmed that Jesus has not only died but been resurrected from the dead, that he's not in the grave. And they are excited again. They are excited because the gang is together. They are excited because this ball that seemed to stop with the death of Jesus is now rolling. And and they are so excited that they say, are you going to do it now? Are you going to do do what we've been thinking for so long? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Israel. And Jesus looks at it and he says, hey, y- y'all quit talking about that. He says, here's what I'm going to tell you. And he, and he lays out the plan. He says, we're going to start right here in Jerusalem. Now think what they would have thought when Jesus looks at them. 
Maybe Peter might be over here. Maybe John might be over here. But the rest of the 120 there, what do you think they were thinking when he says, you're going to start preaching this message in Jerusalem? I don't know. Something inside of me thinks that they might have had a little bit of trepidation. The religious leaders had just killed Jesus in Jerusalem. So if you are a follower of Jesus, chances that you want to go right back into the middle of Jerusalem, then right back in the middle of the place where they killed Jesus, well, you, they don't like you there. But Jesus says, that's where you're going to start. You're going to start where the people don't like you. And they don't like me, but that's not where you're going to stop. He says, we're going to go from Jerusalem, and then something's going to happen that we'll talk about in the book of Acts that happens, and you're going to go to Judea. Well, they liked him in Judea. They liked Jesus in Judea. Judea was the comfortable place. Judea was the place where you like them, they like you, you look like them, they look like you. Everything is comfortable in Judea. He says, but then it's not going to end there. He says, you're going to go from there, you're going to go to Samaria. So don't get comfortable, don't get too comfortable in the place where they like you. Because then I'm going to send you to the place where you don't like them. Because for a Jewish person to go to Samaria, well, they have been taught from their birth that the Jewish people, the Samaritan people, we don't associate with each other. So Jesus on the side of this hill looks at these guys and says, here's, here's, here's the plan, guy. Here, here it is. We're going to start where they don't like you. Then we're going to go to where you like them, but I don't want you to get too comfortable there because we're going to turn it back around and I'm going to send you to the place where you don't like those people. But it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. From there, you guys are going to take this message to the ends of the earth. You're going to take this message to places that you haven't even heard of. You're going to take this message to places that really don't even exist right now. You are going to take this message to a world. And as soon as Jesus says this, he starts floating up into heaven. And as he starts floating up into heaven, I want you to know, we are not talking Chris Angel levitating at the pyramid in Las Vegas. <laughs> With some wire somewhere. I've not figured it out yet. But anyway, we're not talking a few inches off the ground. We're not even talking a few feet off the ground. We're talking about Jesus looks to these guys and he, you know, it, you know the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. He, you know, he, that, that's not till Acts chapter 2. We're still in Acts chapter 1. They are still a little bit, oh, I don't know what's going on in here. And, 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 and he tells them, this is the plan. You're going you're gonna to take it to where they hate you. You're going to go to where it's comfortable. But then you're going to go to where you hate them. And then you're going to go to the ends of the earth. And they have to be wondering, how are we going to do this? We're just ordinary, unschooled people. How are we going to take this message? And then he starts going out of their sight. What do you think they're doing? <laughs> well... Verse 10 tells us what they were doing. They were looking intently up into the sky. That is an understatement if I've ever seen one. I mean, I bet their mouths are open as this is happening because Jesus has given them this what seemingly impossible task. And there they are looking up into the sky when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Jesus just floats up into the sky and all of a sudden beside you are these two dudes and they're in white robes and they come from out of nowhere. So what do you do? I think their heart is pounding. I think they're wondering what in the world is going on. Jesus has just given them this crazy, seemingly impossible to take this message to the entire world, a world that they're not even familiar with yet. And then he just takes the next flight out. In fact, he not only takes the next flight out, he's the pilot of the plane and there is no plane. He's just floating up. And, and if you look at what the Hebrew writer says, when Jesus left the earth, you know where he went. He went to the right hand of the throne of God, and the Hebrew writer says he sat down. I picture a throne that looks a little bit like an easy chair. I don't know. I may make it a little bit too comfortable. Jesus goes from earth to the right hand of God where he sits down, and I think he looks back down. Do you know what I think he sees when he looks back down? I think he goes, oh, heavens, look, they're still just intently gazing up in the clouds because, I mean, he can do that in a flash, can he? And he sees these 120 people, and they are just there, and they are looking up. And I think he's, oh, my. And he looks, I, I think he goes, angel, angel, you know, I need two angels, two warrior angels, Michael, Gabriel, y'all get over here. Go down there and tell them to get busy doing what I need them to do and what I told them to do. So, verse 11, that's what happens. You know, these two men in white come, and they look at, his, they look at these, the men of Galilee, and men there is inclusive, men and women. And he says to them, why do you stand here? Why do you stand here? And I wonder in that phrase if there's a message for us today. Why do you stand here? Why do you stand here when there's work to do? 
Why do you stand there when Jesus has put on your heart to do this or to do that? We're going to talk about those promptings of the Spirit in a few weeks. Why do you stand here when the world needs so much? And he comes and he looks at, he looks at them and he says, why do you stand here? Now, for them, there was a different reason. For them, there was, a, there was the reason that they can't believe what has just gone on. And I'm thinking, what a kind of crazy question is that? I would be like, why do you think I'm standing here, Mr. Angel Man? I mean, Jesus just got levitated out of our sight. And I'm a bit shocked. And yes, I'm even a little bit curious as to where he went. And like, what is going to happen now? Is he coming back? Because that's, I, that's what I would be thinking. I don't know, but I would be thinking like, is this it? Like, is this, is this how the earthly thing ends? <laughs> And these angels look back to these apostles who are still these disciples who are still trying to figure all of this out. And he says these words to them. He says, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, well, guess what? He is coming back. And he's going to come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. And do you know what they did after that? <laughs> they did what Jesus told them to do. Do you know that having the power of the Holy Spirit starts with doing what Jesus told you to do? And usually what he tells you to do isn't that hard at first. Usually he has you take a baby step. And once you take a baby step, you'll have to take a bigger step. And then he'll get you to the point where you're taking bigger steps. And then he might even get you to the point one day where you say, you know what, there's an opportunity in a place where I know no one and I think God has called me there, so I'll leave everything I know and go to a place where I know no one. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. When people say yes to him, they did what Jesus told them to do. They go back to Jerusalem. They gather in a room where they wait for 10 days. 10 days between this happening and the coming of the Spirit in uh, Acts chapter 2. And you know what they did when they gathered in that room? Acts chapter 1 verse 14 tells us they all joined together. Say that word with me. Constantly in prayer. Constantly in prayer. Notice, it does not say they all joined in in some big committee meeting to get some big plan. They were not like, Peter, would you get a whiteboard? John, do you have any dry erase markers over there? Thomas, do we have any paper to chart this out on? To which Thomas says, I doubt it. Anyway, <laughs> some of y'all got that, didn't you? Notice, they didn't form a committee meeting. Do you know what they did? They formed a prayer meeting. They formed a prayer meeting. Don't miss it. These 120 people knew that what God had told them to do was impossible in their own power. So they start praying about it. Very quickly, I want to give you three things from this text to take away and to be going with you this week about the power of the Holy Spirit. Number one, the prerequisite of the power of the coming of the Holy Spirit was not a committee meeting but a prayer meeting. And if you want to see the Holy Spirit work in your life, it will not start with a meeting and our intelligence and what we should do. It will start with a group of people who start praying for God to do in this day and age again what he longs to do. I heard someone say long ago that we have become so used to normal that when abnormal or subnormal or extraordinary shows up, we, we, we don't know how to act. When the Holy Spirit shows up, what we're going to see in the book of Acts is normal isn't normal anymore. Normal isn't normal anymore. And the Holy Spirit power came not from a committee meeting but a prayer meeting. And it seemed to be common knowledge that when the disciples discovered Jesus was missing at times, do you know where they would go look for him? In a place of prayer. It was such, so ingrained in them that even on the night that Jesus was betrayed, when Judas wanted to look for where he might be, Judas knew to go to a place where, as Matthew says, Jesus often went to pray. Every time in Scripture where Jesus faced a big decision in his life, he prayed. When Satan led him up on the mountain and he looked and he said, all these kingdoms of the earth can be yours if you would just bow down to me, Jesus prayed. He prayed. When it was time to choose those men and women, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Mary, all of those, these 120, do you know what he did? It says he prayed, and he didn't pray just a little bit. He prayed all night. Have you ever had something so much on your mind that you prayed all night that you just couldn't go to sleep 
because you knew what God was calling you to do. You knew that the importance of the task before you was so great that you needed a power other than the power you had yourself. When he fed up thousands of people from a little boy's lunch, can you see? He lifted that little boy's lunch towards heaven and he looked up into the sky and he says, I thank you, Father, for what you have given us. And then he begins to hand it out. When he called Lazarus out of a tomb, do you know what he said? <laughs> he stood in front of a tomb and he said, I thank you, Father, that you hear me. I know that you always hear me. When he wanted to, to go into the wilderness, he prayed. When the crowds wanted to take him by force and make him a king, he prayed. And when he faced the toughest night of his life, he prayed. So it's no wonder that the followers of Jesus, when given a task so big that they know they can't do it on their own, when given a task so big they can't visualize it happening, when given a task so big that it seemed impossible, they started not by forming a committee, not by coming up with three easy steps to do the last thing God called me to do, but they started in prayer. And I would say as we begin to look at the work of the Holy Spirit, if you and I want the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives today, it starts when God's people pray. Pray. The prerequisite to the power of God's Holy Spirit is prayer. Second thing I want you to notice from this passage is the purpose of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Which begs the question, power to do what? And the power that he's talking about here, if you were with us for our We Are Church series, that word power is the word that we get dynamite from. I mean, it's not just a little bit of power. I mean, it is an explosive type of power. It is a power that will enable you to live in a, in a kingdom where the king is against you. It's an explosive type of power, but the power to do what, you're asking? Look at the next part of that. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my, say it with me, witnesses. Witnesses. Do you realize that the very first purpose of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts was so that you and I could be better witnesses for Jesus? It's directly tied to the third part of our mission statement. If you know our mission statement, and I hope you do, say it with me. We, are the Northfield Church, exists to make Jesus known. If you grew up in church, that's called evangelism. The very first purpose of the Holy Spirit we see in the early church was to make you and to make me a more effective witness for Jesus. Paul, in the book of Romans, if you want to, to go and have some extra reading in Romans 6, 7, and 8, Paul says to these people who are having to make life and death decisions every day as to whether they're going to live against the, the Roman government for one more day in allegiance to Jesus, Paul promises in the book of Romans that the Spirit would give them the words to say. And as you and I step out in faith and begin to witness about the things that God has, is doing in our lives, we don't step out alone, Paul says. You step out with the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2, it is the Holy Spirit that allowed them to be more effective witnesses for Jesus. Know this, the Holy Spirit always points a believer to Jesus. So if the Holy Spirit tells you to do something that is not of Jesus, you need to know something. That was what you ate last night, not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit only leads the people of God closer to Jesus. Did you know that in talking to others, Paul promises in the book of Romans that he will do that? On the day of Pentecost, when Peter starts preaching, who is Peter preaching about? If you go back and read Acts chapter 2, Jesus is all over Peter's message. Jesus came, Jesus lived, Jesus suffered, but guess what? You killed him, but God raised him up. He has been resurrected from the dead. Let therefore all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus, both Lord and Christ. His whole message was about Jesus. And in John 15, 26, when Jesus is at that last Passover meal with his disciples, they're around the table, and Jesus is talking about, I've got to go away, but I'm going to send an encourager. I'm going to send a comforter to you. Guess what he said that encourager was going to do? He says, when the advocate, encourager, Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify, say it with me, about me. 
A lot of times, you, you, you talk, and we can talk about gifts of the Spirit, but that's another topic for another day. But the greatest gift that the Spirit gives us is the ability to talk about Jesus to other people, to proclaim the message of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will always point you to Jesus, not the works of the Spirit or even the gifts of the Spirit. The Spirit of God will allow us to talk about Jesus. The purpose and power of the Holy Spirit that we see played out here in the book of Acts was to point people to Jesus. I would say this, did you know that it is God's Spirit that takes any words that I say? And if they are meaningful to you at all, or if they touch your heart at all, it is the Holy Spirit that does that. It is not the gift of the one standing before you. I'm going to tell you, it is an accounting major standing before you that uh, sometimes a little OCD, my wife can tell you, and uh, I like my shirts hanging all the same direction and all this stuff, and... I look into the mirror and I realize, you know, I used to have this little pillow with a pattern on it and I used to lay down on it and the pattern would be there on your face and, you know, it would go away after about 10 minutes. It stays for days now. And uh, <laughs> then I've gotten older. And when anyone stands before you, whether it's me or one of our other pastors or whether it's a friend or whether it's you going out in the world and you, you have an opportunity to sit beside someone and minister to them, don't ever confuse the gift that God has given you with the power that he has to move in someone else's life. You take those moments and you say, thank you, God, for using. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, that, that I can be a vessel. It's, it's we jars of clay. That's what we are. Broken pots. I look at you, we're broken pots. But wow, isn't it amazing? how God can use a broken pot to get out his word. And I, I love our incredible worship team. I, I'm looking at a man right there. They can play the guitar like nobody's business. And they, it was every other instrument, I think, so as well. But I'm going to tell you, it's not, it's not the talent of the people on stage that make a difference in the heart of the believer. It's them saying yes to use the gifts that God has bringing them but it's the Holy Spirit who comes and takes the lights and the sound and the, all the technology and the, and the words and brings them to each, of, to each of us. And when you begin to get those nudges and you get to get those urges, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that does that. And the power of God's Spirit in you will enable you to speak about Jesus to the people God brings our way. I'm going to call the band back up because we're going to end in a couple of songs today and in, in communion. And it leads us to number three, the proof of the Holy Spirit power. The proof of Holy Spirit power. What is the proof of God's Spirit in my life? We saw the prerequisite. It starts with prayer. We saw the purpose of it is to point people to Jesus. What is the proof of it? I think it's important to establish this. The proof of the Spirit is not the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit that you will read about is the provision that the Spirit offers. The proof of the Spirit, the proof that I can know the Holy Spirit is working in my life. Well, it's laid out for me in Galatians 5.22. Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit. Well, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience. It's kindness goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit. You want to know the, the fruit of a person who is following Jesus? Paul says, here it is. How well do you love? 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that even if I speak with the tongues of men and angels and don't have love, it's nothing. It's like a, it's like a, just a noisy sound before the Father. He goes on and he says, even if I give my body to be burned, if I do all these acts of stuff, if, if, I, if, if I prophesy, if I, if I call down fire from heaven, I can do all of that stuff. And he says, but if you don't have that fruit of God's working in your life, I, I love what Rick Warren wrote in one of his books. Uh, he said, uh, uh, he said, without love, nothing I say really matters. Nothing I do really matters. Nowhere I go really matters. It is love that pulls it all together. Patience. You know, uh, you know, you know how to tell a fruit of the Spirit working in your life? Well, it may have a lot to do with how you act with the traffic when we leave here today. <laughs> Just saying. 
Because if you can't control it on Sunday, oh man, we better be praying for you on Monday. <laughs> Self-control. Often we look in and sometimes we'll discern, won't we, and we'll make judgments about uh, people. Because we're called to be fruit inspectors, fruit inspectors. And, uh, and we'll make, well, that's, that's, that's a follower of Jesus. That, that's a, you know how Paul says, you know a follower of Jesus? How well do they exhibit self-control? <coughs> Next time you want to put somebody up as a follower of Jesus, don't look at how they preach. Don't look at how they sing. Don't look at all these things that we might want to look at them. Look at how they love people. Look at how they're patient with people. Are they kind? Are they kind with people? Not just the people they agree with, but the people they don't agree with. It is the landmark decision Jesus said of his followers. Blessed are you when you love your enemies, when you do good to those who hate you and use you. For in doing so, you show yourself to be the children of your Father who is in heaven. For he sends his Son to shine on the just and the unjust. The fruit of the Spirit. Wow. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. All of those things go together to make us who we are. Want to know if a person is getting closer to Jesus? Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit of their lives. Uh, interesting little thing that I found out several years ago is when Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, do you know that he actually uses a word there that talks about the intimate relationship between a man and a woman? And, and the result when, uh, when, when you, for those of you who have children, do you know what, you know what the children are? <laughs> they are proof that at some point in a man and woman's life that somebody's been close, somebody's been intimate. And that's what Paul is saying here. You want to tell if a person's been close to Jesus? You want to tell if a person's been intimate with God? Wow, how well do they love? How kind are they? How much self-control do they exhibit in their life? How patient are they? Wow. <laughs> All of those, if you look at those lists, I would say the greatest prayer you could pray would be look at that list and of those things that you're lacking, because we're all lacking something on that list, aren't we? Maybe the greatest prayer we could leave here praying today is, God, help me in my patience. God, help me in my self-control. Spirit, work in power in my life. Those times when, when I need to be kind to somebody who's not been kind to me. And this Spirit-led life, well, it leads us to a new community. A community that at one time changed the world. And I wonder... I wonder if the book of Acts is telling me it can be that way again. And maybe in some way that's what we celebrate each time we take communion together. If you got your cup, I, if you would peel back that first layer, you know, it was around that table where they first celebrated this Passover turn communion message with Jesus that Jesus promised to send this Holy Spirit power. And you know what, the, what Jesus was doing when he died on the cross? He was cleaning up this temple, cleaning up this body, making a way that this body could once again be holy so that the Holy Spirit could move in, so that the Holy Spirit could take up residence, not in a temple made with hands, but in a temple not made with hands. So maybe as we celebrate what God did today through us, through the bread that we'll take together, we celebrate and we remember that God cleaned me up so the Holy Spirit could move in. Could we take the bread together? And as you peel back that second layer and take the juice, it is a reminder of the deep, deep, blood of Jesus that takes away the sins of the world. <laughs> Father, I thank you for leaving us a reminder. <laughs> a reminder, Father, of what you have done for each of us. Father, in this moment, thank you for the bread and thank you for the juice and the reminder of how it washes us clean. And thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit has moved in and taken up residence in our life. So, Father, 
As we sing these next songs in worship to you, we worship a God who makes mountains move. You make giants fall. So, Father, make the giants fall in our life. You use songs of praise to shake prison walls. You were faithful then. You are faithful now. Thank you for loving us. And all of God's people, in the name of Jesus, said, Amen.